Now run! Hello guys, nice to meet you. I'm Leah and this is Dying to Know. If you're dying to know what's going on in the world of Dying Light 2, then you're in the right place. He will be showing you all the news, the latest from the Dying Light world. We'll be announcing a few contests. We'll be talking to developers. And probably most importantly, we're going to be showing you a brand new gameplay trailer where you can see the current state of the Dying Light 2 game. But first, there's someone here I need to introduce you to. It's Aidan Caldwell. I'm a pilgrim, an outcast, roaming like a Japanese ronin or an Old West Desperado. My past is dark, but my future has a tiny, dying light at the end of this tunnel. Hello, guys. My name is Jonas Scott, and I voice Aiden Caldwell in Dying Light 2. But before that, I'm gonna host this program with Leia, if you don't mind. My pleasure. Well, I'm ready. Jonah's definitely ready. And I hope you're ready. So if you're dying to know, just like us, then stick with us. The story told in Dying Light 2 occurs 20 years after the events of the first game. And if you're wondering what happened in those intervening 20 years, well, there's no better person to ask than the Dying Light 2 world director, Thomas Gabau, with who I'll be talking in just a moment. And after that, I'll be speaking with Piet Germenic, the narrative director of the game, to about the characters that appear in Dying Light 2. Welcome to the show, Thomas. So the first question I have for you today is, do I need to have played Dying Light 1 to sort of understand what's happening in Dying Light 2? No, actually, you don't. Uh, like you mentioned before, a game takes place some 20 years later, mm -hmm. in a world where humankind has lost the war to the virus. So right. in a way, you could say that Dying Light 2 takes us to the world beyond the apocalypse. Intriguing. All right, tell me more, please. Well, you remember the events of Heron in 2014. Mm -hmm. Well, after that, well, leaders, they had a tough choice to make. They had to isolate the city of Heron. Right. Uh, for that, they created an exclusion zone. Like in Chernobyl, only a lot more people were left to die inside the walls. Yeah, right. So they just isolated the entire city. And did it help? Did it stop the virus? Yeah, for, for a while it worked. Uh, enough for everyone to forget about it, at least. Uh, only in secret, a handful of scientists continued to study the virus. You know, manipulating his DNA, creating new strains. They were looking for commercial military applications. So, you know, they're doing it for the money, really. Yeah, oh, of course. So what happened next? Well, next, the shit hit the fan. By Christmas 2021, one of these mutated strains escaped from a Liverpool laboratory located near Geneva. No. Uh, we don't really know if this, uh, if this was accidental or not, but uh, this time the virus was much faster than any government. Before the world could react, civilization was on the brink of collapse. People were dying in the streets, capital cities were burning. Mm. By the end of 2023, 98% of the population had been lost to the wow. virus. There was a few settlements remaining, but only one city was still standing. The last bastion of mankind, our city, Villador, aka the city. Right, so Villador is what we have left. So that's everything that's happened outside of the city. What actually happens inside Villador? Well, the city has unique rules. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it's surrounded by uh, seemingly impassable walls. And inside the walls, the people that decided to use a radical new weapon against the infection, oh. which actually gave them the upper hand in the first stages of the pandemic, okay. but it also created terrifying new monster archetypes. 15 years on, a new equilibrium sort of emerged in the city. By daylight, human factions fight to control the city, and at night, the streets become the realm of, of these bloodthirsty infected monsters. Great. Well, um, that is extremely interesting. Thank you very much, Thomas. And we'll be hearing more about the vibrant and fantastic city soon, I hope. But first, I think we need to hear a little bit more about the characters. Our uh, second guest is a man of two industries, cinema and gaming. In a previous life, he wrote the hit HBO series, Wataha? Wataha, yeah. Wataha. Um, and then he moved on to Techland to become a narrative director, Piotr Jemenek. Hi, guys. Thank you. 
So uh, we have plenty of time to talk about the rest of the characters in Dying Light 2. There are, there are tons of them. But today, I think we want to focus on Aiden Caldwell, the protagonist. Do you, you want to talk more about him? Or? Yeah, sure. So uh, Aiden, uh, he's the member of Outcasts, you know? The group of people traveling through this dangerous world of Dying Light 2 called Pilgrims because he's looking for his relative. The person whom he lost many, many years ago. And that person is his only memory from the past and uh, the only answer to whom Aiden really is. Aiden is a really rich, deep character, very, very much cooler than I am. Oh, but, no, uh, come on. <laughs> I mean, he can run across buildings, jump from rooftop to rooftop, use all kinds of weapons. Yeah, well, you know, he didn't have much choice. This world is full of infected, bloodthirsty creatures, so he didn't have much choice, right? The weak die, the strong survive, and Aiden, he just has to be strong. But why did he come like that? Why, why him? That's the main question of the game, and the player will have uh, opportunity also to decide how Aiden will evolve. Will he help the weak? Uh, will it distract him from his main goal? Or maybe he will just strive to the end of his search as soon as possible. I, I can't imagine trying to survive or live in a city like that as a lone wolf by yourself without any kind of support. Well, he's not gonna be alone, you know? He will meet many people. But again, depending on the player choices, some of them will become his allies, but some of them will become his uh, enemies. One of the group he will encounter are the Night Runners, mm -hmm. uh, the former special force officers who were sick of uh, the army's cynicism and lack of concern for common people. But they were brave enough to help the people during the night. And the night, as you know, is right. pretty horrifying in the game. Yeah, so Aiden joins them, joins the Night Runners? Oh, that's the question, my friend. The player will have to answer too. I won't spoil the pleasure of discovering Aiden's actions and true motivations, but what I can share with you is uh, the fact that we really put big effort to make this character and many others complex and multidimensional. But there is so much more to be discovered during the game. Oh, that's fascinating. I can't wait to learn more. Thank you so much, Pierre. Thank you. Thank you. So before we watch the gameplay trailer of Dying Light 2 for the first time, we need to talk about something which is basically at the center of the Dying Light universe, which is... The community. Over the past few years, Dying Light has amassed over 23 million players and a 95% positive review rating on Steam. Which in Steam Talk is overwhelmingly positive, so bravo. Yeah, we'd like to take a few seconds and thank you guys. Thank you all for being on this journey with us. Thank you for sharing your love with others of Dying Light. And thank you for these great moments spent together. Dying Light 1 has some amazingly creative fans, which is fantastic, pardon the pun, because we're going to be starting a brand new contest which will combine your love of Dying Light with that same creativity. Yeah, with the release date of Dying Light 2 drawing ever closer, we'd like to extend our hand and invite you to make the community a little bit bigger. If you find yourself skilled in the ways of visual arts, writing, or costumes and cosplay, please, Join the Dying Light universe. So check out dyinglightgame.com forward slash contest. And if you win, there's a fantastic monetary prize on the line. But also there's some other great rewards you could be in with a chance with winning as well. Like a uh, platinum edition of Dying Light? Look at this. This is the finest edition of Dying Light ever made. This is the platinum edition of Dying Light. This has every bit of content ever released for Dying Light in one place. It's Massive. I mean, look at it. For those of you who haven't experienced Dying Light yet, we are introducing Dying Light 1 Platinum Edition. It's the biggest and most complete edition to have ever existed. And we're offering it to you now at an historically low price. All the content, lowest price. There's literally no better time to buy than now. And you can get it on Steam, Xbox, and PlayStation. Get your Platinum Edition of Dying Light now. This is the best offer, like, ever. I guess we don't have time to go over everything that's in the Platinum Edition, but it is everything. This is how it looks.
Okay, so I'm excited because you guys are in just a second gonna see the official gameplay trailer for Dying Light 2. And then after that, we're gonna interview some of the devs that made it possible. So without further ado, here it is. Hey everyone, we've been quiet for some time since like the rest of the world, we had some unforeseen hurdles to clear, but the wait is over. Let's dive into the open world of Dying Light 2. The last slice of Dying Light 2 showcased the mission from the main storyline. You get after those fuck. You saw how your decisions influenced the narrative and notably changed the environment. This time, we want to give you a broader look at the game and a sneak peek at some of the things we'll be talking about in upcoming months. In Dying Light 2, you become Aiden Caldwell, an outsider trying to unravel a tangled mystery from his past. Its trail leads him to the city, probably the last bastion of mankind in the world. Oh, shit! At first, you feel like this intense, brutal place will tear you apart. But then you meet the Night Runners, veteran survivors who helped people in better days. By the way, I'm Hakon. You were a Night Runner. You used to help people, remember? Night Runners are gone. Finished. A myth. And although it's not entirely clear you can trust them, you need allies in the dark. And these are the modern Dark Ages. It's been 15 years since the apocalypse and the world has changed. The old civilization has fallen, but a new one has been built on its ashes. People fight desperately for scarce resources. The rules are broken and weakness is punished. She's innocent! Three factions struggle for position in the city. Survivors pride themselves on being able to adapt to any circumstances and cobble together safe zones almost everywhere. Peacekeepers, loyal soldiers, who want to impose their version of law and order and trample all in their path. Renegades, ex-prisoners serving their ruthless colonel, seeking to become sole rulers of the city. Where is Waltz? Make him tough. <laughs> Use these factions to reach your goal. Help or harm them to reshape the city to your liking. Just remember, each faction contains complex characters. Nosy Parker, ain't ya? Got some kind of bad habit of yours? So, will you follow cold calculation or your heart? The bazaar needs good people. Help us and you'll find a home here. Some in the city offer no chance for an alliance. Bandits, outlaws, and common thugs live only to plunder and kill, plunging the streets into chaos. Yet, nightfall scares all of them equally. Darkness changes the rules of the world. As the light fails, monsters crawl out of hiding to prey on the poor souls caught outside the safety of UV rays. Hordes of infected pour into the streets like decaying lava. The deadly spawn of 15 years of mutation and evolution. Your only escape? Exploit the city's verticality and flee to the roofs. Though even there, you are never safe from swift and deadly virals. Or even greater threat. Yet night brings opportunity as well. Nests rife with infected during the day now lie empty. 
To explore them, you must tread carefully. But those brave enough to face the terrors of the night can loot a jackpot. Luckily, you have all the tools you need to survive. Your extraordinary parkour skills allow you to navigate even the most treacherous terrain. On the roofs, you can count on your parkour acrobatics to save your life. But often, you'll have to face your enemies head on. And then you have to be smart, resourceful, and determined. We've worked hard on the essence of our combat, making sure swinging a big, meaty weapon is fun, satisfying, and well executed. But even the most brutal fights can be tactical as well. You have multiple ways to hone your skills toward the gameplay style that suits you best. It's up to you if you focus mostly on mobility and parkour, or aggressive, blunt force combat, or a crafty approach where the tools you've created get the job done. Every ability you learn can be a game changer and possibly a new favorite move. Things move fast and quick in Dying Light 2. Each moment matters. Each move could mean triumph or defeat. Choose your actions and friends carefully. Everything you do in the city can reshape the gameplay environment, change the course of the narrative, and decide the fate of the city's residents. But most importantly, you decide your own fate as well. You're about to turn. Make sure to stay human. An extensive post-apocalyptic world. I really like that divisiveness, you know, the uh, life on the roof and then, and then death on the streets. Yeah, like the intensity of the day and the night cycle mm. together. Yeah, it's almost like Dying Light 2 is two different games put together into one. Yeah, like despite that, despite all the brutality going on on the ground floor, there's something about like the rooftops and the plants It's, and it's stuff. cozy. Yeah, I kind of, kind of want to be there. <laughs> uh, but it does feel like every decision is vital. Like your choices actually do have some consequences. Yeah. Choices and consequences are incredibly vital to Dying Light 2's gameplay. And we're going to interview some devs and talk about some other very vital gameplay mechanics. <laughs> Our next guest is Adrian Pisa Shizewski. Hi. Hi. Welcome. And that gameplay looked awesome. I know we can't wait to get our hands yeah. on it, but congrats. Thank you. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. for sure. It looks like you guys have a very unique world and a very unique game. Where, where y'all get your inspiration from? Oh, that was a research. We did a deep dive into the history of our world, and we found repetitive patterns. We found that people use the same behaviors in the past after the fall of civilization or after the fall of the nation that's supposed to be a backbone of our world. So our approach was super simple. We just copycat those behaviors and attitudes and show you how our world would look like after the fall. However, it's, uh, it's kind of obvious that the main reason that civilization fall is a uh, virus pandemic or eventually the uh, economical collapse. Yeah, that's, that's basically obvious thing. But it's even darker if you connect those things with the research we did in, at the beginning of the production. So people will question everything. They're gonna blame everything and everyone that's supposed to guide us in our lives every day. So they're gonna blame governments, they're gonna blame law, they're gonna blame science or even religion. Some people might, might ask themselves that where was God when it happened to us, basically, you know? So I feel that all of those things together creates the sensation that it's a giant step backward for our civilization. So Dying Light 2 has a subtitle, Stay Human. What does that mean? <laughs> well, it's, it's super hard to, to remember those values that makes us human. So like compassion or, or support. So 
the entire fall that those dark times we have is a, is a big test for, for everyone. And I think it's even harder test because to stay human, people would sacrifice what's the most important for them or sometimes risk their lives. Wow, so that's like really intense. And there's like the obvious like double meaning to it, which is what I was thinking. Stay human, don't become a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but one disclaimer, those are not zombies. You know, those, oh. those are infected people that turn to be a, a monster. They're just crossing a line you know, and they're turning to be a monster, you know, because in Dying Greater we all infected. Yeah, we all wearing this biomarker, you know yeah, it, and yeah. you're wearing this, <laughs> I'm wearing this. I'm, that's a watch actually, but <laughs> you know that, you know, so that's, uh, that's the thing. So the, the challenge is to not cross this line at all costs. So that's the biggest challenge of staying human in this meaning. Mm. I see, yeah, not zombies. Not zombies. Not zombies. <laughs> at all. People have crossed the line. <laughs> All right, well, fascinating. Thank you so much, Adrian. We're definitely going to be hearing from you again soon. Yeah, thank you so much. We have with us Katarzyna Tarnatska, the environmental art director. Hi. <laughs> and we have game designer Michal Dujak. Hello. So, choices and consequences. The player has to make a choice, and they have to experience or endure the consequences. What does that mean? Basically, the whole system of choice and consequences is really, really complex. Uh, I would say the best way to describe it is that the player is making the decisions based on three layers. First one are the choices that you do during the main story missions. And though those big changes are actually can change the whole game or even how the story ends. The second layer are choices when you, that you do while the quests. And those choices can actually uh, influence the mission itself. And the last one, the last layer is so-called city alignment system. And I, as an open world game designer, would like to focus on. Please do, go on. All right, so water and electricity are basically a key to survive in every world. Mm -hmm. By restoring it, player cannot not only unlock the water or electricity in the area, but he can also, based on his decision, assign it to one of the factions, which will influence how the district looks like or who's going to live inside of it. But it also, what is pretty more important for a player, unlock new tools for him, like unique tools for each factions, like car traps, zip lines, or a trampoline. That player can use in exploration to deal with bandits or infected, or simply to move faster through the city. Mm. So basically, based on your choices, you shape the game environment, which gives you a different experience every time you start a new game. And what is worth mentioning here that Dying Light 2 is playable up to four co-op players. Ah. So you can host the game or join other players and see how their choices came up differently to your own. Right. Interesting. Hmm. There's one thing I'm really curious about though. Uh, night versus day. How does the gameplay differ from the night and the day? Well, the short answer is that day is for humans and night is for the monsters. Mm. But to describe it a little bit better, I would say that during the day, humans I mean, factions, bandits, or survivors scavenging the city and searching for some scraps or someone who might have them. Mm -hmm. And this is the best time for a player to explore the city, meet its citizens, learn the stories, day-to-day -day agenda, or even simply help them in a quest or open world activities mm. to survive those dark ages. Yeah, and that sounds quite pleasant, uh, but I'm guessing night changes everything. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. During the night, all the infected get out of the buildings, mm. And compared to the Dying Light 1, the night is going to be even more intense this time. Intense in terms of the amount of enemies, the new types and new, more aggressive behaviors. And what is important, this time night can mean also opportunity. An opportunity for the players who are carriage and skilled enough to use the fact that all the infected are outside and buildings are accessible to explore them and search for the most valuable loot in the game. Katarzyna, you're responsible for the post-apocalyptic look of the city. Can you tell us a little bit how about the city became to look that way? Yes. I guess the important thing to realize is in 2025, uh, the decision was made to use a chemical attack to stop the spread of the Haran virus. And the result is a tight ring of chemically active areas around the city. The, some of the uh, chemicals have gotten into the groundwater mm. and spread under the surface, killing every living plant and every living thing in its reach. What it means for the city is that the street levels are virtually dead. Mm. The soil is uh, unable to sustain any life, any plant, and 
the street level is a domain of the monsters, just decaying in every aspect. Wow, so it sounds like there's, there's just no healthy organic life down there at all. Not really. The, the survival on the street level is pretty tough. So the common people are just visitors there, but the life prevailed. It moved up to the rooftops. And this is where, where the plants are flourishing and blooming in the, in the <laughs> post-apocalyptic landscape. And this is where people build and develop the, the new world of Dying Light 2. Uh, electricity producing windmills and safe zones for the player. And in a way, in a metaphorical sense, the rooftops are the new default ground floor, the level zero. And trip to the streets is in a way, a trip underground, a minus one of sorts, just the corpse of, uh, of a lost civilization. Wow. Intense. Yeah, that's, <laughs> to, to, to say the least, I, I can't imagine being a citizen living in that, that city, let alone being a player and how, how challenging that's going to be. Yeah, and hold that thought. Thank you very much for joining us today, uh, but it's now time to introduce our next guests. Uh -huh. With us now are Bartosh and Peter. And guys, I have one question about the open world in Dying Light 2. How big is it? It's pretty big. We, we know that. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit more? Yes, of course. Uh, the map in Dying Light 2 is divided into two huge regions and several zones. Okay. Uh, there are plenty leftovers from the lost civilization for you to scavenge. But we didn't want uh, our players to perceive the map only horizontally. So uh, we see the map as a multi-level 3D world that supports your traversal and helps you solve parkour puzzles. Hmm. Yes, in-house we call it multi-layer open world exploration. And you know, the movement system from Dying Light 1, we remove every restriction from the player. You can move everywhere you want, how you want to do it. And when I think about it, I think that was a big challenge for us to create the geometry that supports all of that. And we did it, and I think we did it well. Doing the same thing in Dying Light 2 wasn't our goal. We want to make one or more step forward to surprise the player expectation. That's why we doubled the number of park moves. Doubled, and I mean, it's not like there was a shortage yeah. in Dying Light yeah. 1, so what? <laughs> yes, the iconic Dying Light 1 parkour is essential there. We improve it. We double the number of parkour moves. The players will see over 3,000 different parkour animations. Wow. From the basic move, through the tricks, to the small little tasty details there that you can see it. Okay, well, unfortunately, I'm going to have to stop you there, but don't hate me because in the next episode, we're going to be talking more about parkour and how the team have managed to make an authentic urban running experience in Dying Light 2. Yeah, thank you guys so much for the information. Bartosz, Peter, it's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, so the last and arguably the most important question I'm sure you have is when is the release date? Yeah, that is a very, 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 very important question. And luckily, we have the answer. And that answer is the, the 7th, 7th of December. December. <laughs> Waited years to say that out loud. <laughs> and now that we know the release date of the game, it's time for you to go pre-order it. Go to dyinglight.com slash pre-order, select your platform, and then hit pre-order. And there you go. Congratulations. You just pre-ordered one of the most anticipated games of this year. Go you. Oh, wow. I want one. Well, I've got good news for you then, because this official figurine is part of the collector's edition of Dying Light 2, and you can get one for yourself if you want. Mm. Uh, we'll leave like a, a proper unboxing of the whole set to the professionals, but we do have it all in front of us right now, so it'd be rude not to take a look. Uh, you get in the collector's edition a concept art book full of stunning artwork from the game. You get this uh, steel book, which will have your game inside it, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and you get this uh, interesting little sort of UV flashlight. So, oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> it looks like there's all sorts of vanity elements in here, too, like some legendary skin packs, uh, as well as all sorts of digital elements. Uh, and for more information on these digital elements, uh, please visit the pre-order website. I want this. And I want Dying Light, too. Kind of thought you'd say that. Well, if you're feeling the same way, then uh, I've got good news, because you can pre-order the collector's edition However, it is very, very limited, so you'll have to be very quick. Mm -hmm. Rest assured, there will be plenty of the standard edition for your standard gamer, but if you're into special editions, there is a deluxe edition of Dying Light 2 with a steel book, a legendary pack, and a digital soundtrack, and much, much more. So to summarize, that's three different editions that you can buy depending on what you're after. 
And if you just can't wait until release to get immersed in the world of Dying Light 2, then why don't you go check out the Technon Gamers and Goodies website for more info. Yeah, this is a program for all gamers. Whether or not you want updates on Dying Light 2 with the news, or you want Dying Light 2 items in Dying Light 1, everyone's going to find something they like there. Yep, and uh, this is just an initial offering as well. Check back later for even more details, more information, and we'll be going through it in future episodes as well. That's it. Don't forget to pre-order the game and take part in our contests. The details are on the game's website. And here's a sneak peek at the topic of the next episode. Thank you for watching and stay safe out there. Bye. See ya.